100th episode uh, we have a stalwart presenter to uh, today uh, the topic will be mental health and well being among doctors the ground rules are simple everyone is on the mute mode uh, the panelists will be able to unmute themselves the questions will be invited in the chat box uh, uh, next slide please please so, unmute batam sir and uh, anand raju sir thank you uh, please make them co-host so they can unmute themselves so let me uh, hand over the program to professor dr tufan pati sir he is from katak chairman of this program he is the national advisory board member of iapp chairman of membership membership sub committee of ips life fellow of iiopm uh, uk he has organized ansip toys uh, private psychiatry conference toys and next ansip again we are going to him uh, he has been formerly vice chairman iapp president ips e zone and odisha editor of industrial psychiatry journal he has chaired various positions in the organizations so he has a huge organizational experience and as you see we have even 100 episode without any hiccups so all credit goes to dr tofan patisar for guiding us sir over to you thank you thank you alim i take this privilege to welcome all the esteemed guests and speakers among our midst who are international luminaries next next slide please these are a few glimpses of the thrust and musings we have heard so far though there the days of quarantine containment and lockouts everyone was in a panic meeting others was difficult and it appeared as if many things have come to a standstill at this point of time it was conceptualized that we can have thrust and musings and heads up the, to the cooperation of dr alim siddiqui dr Uh, Amrit Patodasi, Sarda, Rucha, and <clears throat> uh, Sadia, all of them were together. We had the first episode on 23rd July 2020. It's the first episode in Nagpur episode. Topic: Reflections on Psychotherapy Processes. An initiation by Dr. Deepak Kumar Nimans. The chairperson was Dr. Gautam Shah, the incumbent president of Indian Psychiatric Society. and the veteran past president of ips dr vidya dhawan i am really grateful for the encouragement inspiration and help by dr gautam shahdi the president of ips in our venture we had the golden jubilee 50th edition on the 8th july 2021 topic was current mental health challenges in diverse india needed advocacy and that occasion we had the chief guest dr professor javed al show he was there thank you sir for being with us on that occasion and this occasion too he was the president of wpa and he spoke on global mental health challenges in view of covid pandemic today is the centenary the 100th edition by the 99th episode we had 32536 participants in the musings and facebook link is available for all the episodes we can send it to anyone who needs it next one please i had the pleasure and this pleasure i have and many occasions to introduce dr afzal javed who had been who is the wpa president from october 2020 he is a consultant psychiatrist and honorary professor in institute of applied health and research university of birmingham and honorary associate clinical professor at mental health and wellbeing warwick medical school he graduated from king edwards medical college in lahore as the chairman of pakistan psychiatric research center he served the royal college of psychiatry as deputy and associate register and chairman of west midlands division he is the past president of fpa he is the past president of wapr world association of psychiatric rehabilitation his areas of interest involve social and transcultural psychiatry psychosocial rehabilitation and psychiatric research with this i seek permission of dr javed to have a formal symbolic inauguration next slide please next next and no no go to previous one and i request dr afzal javed to declare the this webinar inaugurated and deliver his address
you click on that well, th thank you very much dr tufan pati uh, it's really a player to be among uh, very important professionals not only from india but from all over the world so with blessings from everyone let's start the proceedings of today's session please declare this has inaugurated the uh, the session is on and the meeting is inaugurated and Mr. Mandal, please stop sharing. We'll again restart sharing after Dr. Afzal Jawed's speech. Yes. Good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, dear friends from India, office bearers of Indian Psychiatric Society esteemed colleagues, friends, and very dear participants. I'm grateful to Dr. Tufan Pati, to Dr. Sadiqi for inviting me. I have been closely attending <clears throat> most of these webinars, which are very important in the field of psychiatric education. We are grateful that uh, this particular activity was supported by Indian Psychiatric Society, as well as Private Psychiatric Association in India and many other organizations, professional organizations from India. I think it's really a moment of a great privilege that this 100 lecture is being delivered by Professor Dinesh Pugra, who is really a big leader in international psychiatry. And in addition to his contributions to WPA as past president, he has done a lot many things in international psychiatry, being the president of Royal College of Psychiatrists and British Medical Association. This will be really a moment of great excitement for all of us that a series of seminar, which was started by our Indian colleagues, especially during this pandemic stage, has helped thousands of people, not only gaining the knowledge, but also listening to the experts and getting their expertise updated through all these lectures. And the other interesting aspect of these seminars is Dr. Dufan Pati's effort and his enthusiasm that there was no break and his team must be congratulated for this great work. I do hope that recordings of all these webinars, lectures will be available. And if the organizers would like, we can always try to add this link to WPA's website. Because whatever you have done, it is not only for India or for the region, it is for the global psychiatry. And I think inviting Professor Dinesh Pogra is a bonus for all of us. So with these words, I once again congratulate all the organizers, office bearers of IPS, and many presidents, past presidents, and prominent leaders are participating in today's webinar. So thank you very much. And thanks to Indian colleagues for uplifting and highlighting psychiatry, not only at a national or regional level, but also at an international level. So thank you very much. And all the best, Dr. Tufan. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I shall tonight share with you all the links. Thank you, sir. Sir, please. Thank you, Dr. Javed. Please be with us as much as you can. And if possible, come back. 
and please start sharing the rest of the slides. Dr. Alim Siddiqui, next one please. Dr. Alim Siddiqui, who had been the moderator, companion, designer, planner with, in our group from the very outset, is the professor of psychiatry and HOD of Fieras Lucknow Medical College, hospital director of Healthy Minds and Neuropsychiatry Behavioral Sciences College, and is honorary treasurer of IPS. Is director, he had been the direct council member of IPS earlier. He is guest faculty in Amit University, Lucknow. He is vice president of the IMA Lucknow branch. He is honorary treasurer of IAPP UK and UK chapter. He is editor in chief of Indian Association of Biological Psychiatry. He has 23 publications and presentations of research and 58 faculty lectures three psychiatry book chapters, more than 100 newspaper articles, multiple TV, radio, public interaction programs by awareness. Next slide, please. Equally vibrant, Dr. Amrit Patujoshi, who is professor of psychiatry in High Tech Medical College, Bhubaneswar, neuropsychiatrist, psychotherapist, and wellness consultant. He is a direct council member of Indian Psychiatric Society. And he is the editor, he had been the editor of Policy Journal of Psychiatry, now he is the president-elect. He's the chief, he had the chief coordinator of UNICEF, WHO, and IPS Initiative and Telemedicine and Psychosocial Management during COVID-19 when our program started. Welcome, Dr. Amrit and Dr. Ali. Next, please. Next one. We have Gautam Shah to whom we are is mainly obliged because when he envisaged this program, thought of this program, he was the president of IPS and provided us unconditional support and was there all throughout. He is the director, Clinic Brain Neuropsychiatric Institute and Research Center, Barasat. He is the immediate past president of Indian Psychiatric Society. He is the president of SARC Federation of Psychiatrists. He is the president-elect 2019-21. Now he is the, of Indian Association of Geriatric Mental Health. He had been, and he is the editor of Indian Association of Private Psychiatry. Welcome, Dr. Gautam He is our guest of honor. And next, please. Next slide, please. Our special guest, Dr. Sekhar Seshadri, who is quite well known to us, being here on many occasions, and he, we, we feel him a part of the Musings family. Welcome, Dr. Seshadri. He is a child psychiatrist with over 35 years of experience in the field of child mental health. As former senior professor in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry in MN, his work has extended beyond the clinical population to children and child care institutions, service providers across the country as well as the South Asia region. Some of his special areas of interest are childhood trauma, gender and sexuality issues, and life skill education, in the belief that wider psychosocial interventions are rooted in the child rights, in addition to his preventive, promotive, and curative child mental health interventions. He has undertaken various legal and policy related initiatives. All his policy and practice work find its way into training and capacity building programs for the target audiences, ranging from students to service providers. Shambhad, a national initiative of integrated resource for child protection, mental health and psychosocial care, supported by the Minister of Women and Child Development, Government of India was conceptualized and initiated by Shekhar and is now being maintained by Dr. Shekhar Shekhar. Welcome, Shah. Welcome to the smile. Next, please. Our chairperson and president of Indian Psychiatric Society, Dr. N. N. Raju. He is a consultant psychiatrist over many years, a very popular psychiatrist. He was the ex-professor of psychiatry of Andhra Medical College, Vishakapatnam, and is a very close friend of mine. Welcome, Dr. Raju. Next, our chairperson, past president of Indian Psychiatric Society, Dr. E. Mohandas. At current, he is the consultant psychiatrist, Sun Medical and Research Center, Pishur. He is director and professor of International Institute of Organizational Psychological Medicine. He is Indian chair of training and skills, International Bioethics, Asia Pacific. He is a member of WPA Psychopharmaco Psychiatry Section. Some of his achievements are he delivered more than 1,000 presentations, published more than 75 research papers, and edited five books. Recipient of Bharat Ratna Dr. Radha Krishnan Gold Medal Award. Recipient of Gold M Award for Excellence and Innovative Leadership in Mental Health in August 2020. He recently awarded the Bharat Ratna Mother Teresa Gold Medal Award for Outstanding Individual Achievement in 
His previous positions, WPA Journal represented June 16, Chair of WPA Section in Psychiatry in Developing Countries, Chair in Indian Association of Biological Psychiatry, and President of IPS, IAPP, and Society for Bipolar Disease in India. Dear, dear, very dear Dr. E. Mohandas, I welcome you. And before I hand over this meeting to Dr. Amrit Parjoshi to take over the further proceedings as MOC, a semblance comes to my mind. Father Feria has been mentioned by Dr. Moniz at Igar Moniz, the Nobel laureate, in was CTP second edition when a student, but we did not know that he is an Indian. Recently, he got a book and I learned it. And what is common that he held Thursday classes in Marseille, and that was successful in the early 19th century. And Thursday Musing, we believe, will be successful too in times to come. With this, I hand over the request to Dr. Amrit Patrizoshi to please carry over the program. Dr. Amrit Patrizoshi. Thank you, Tufan, sir. Thank you. Congratulations to you because you are the guiding light for whatever we thought about and we brought it into, you know, into the virtual space. So may I call upon Dr. Sir N.N. Raju. N.N. Raju, sir, President of the Indian Psychiatric Society, to give his opening remarks. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Amrit. Yeah, sorry for my interrupted... Hello? The, uh, ...participation because I'm in Kodai Canal where uh, the uh, net connection is slightly disturbing and distracting. Mr. Mandir, please that, stop uh, sharing. You will uh, switch uh, later. Mr. Mandir, please stop, stop sharing. Let our president speak. Yes. No. Uh, I'm really to be part of uh, the centenary uh, webinar and of uh, Thursday Musings and uh, such a pleasure and honor to be same screen of Dr. Afzal Javed, Dr. Dinesh Bhugra, and the great stalwarts, world leaders, world stalwarts to whom we all look upon as our ideal, as our, uh, I mean, uh, as our guiding forces uh, in <clears throat> delivering the mental health to the entire population of the entire world. And we're really happy that uh, it's such a beautiful evening. You could bring in such stalwarts to make us uh, participate in this program. Uh, the It also talks very high of the team of Thursday Musings that you could move on and continue to deliver for the last 100 weeks or so uh, uninterrupted. And also had had, I think, very many luminaries delivering their expertise, delivering their wisdom, and sharing their knowledge all over the world. And also it makes volumes of a uh, uh, lot of uh, your efforts, about uh, more than 400, 500 delegates participate in each uh, week. And that I think that speaks volumes. And I congratulate the entire team of uh, Dr. Um, Tufan Pati, Dr. Amrit Patajoshi, ably aided by Dr. Alim Siddiqui, uh, and also I congratulate the Orissa <laughs> branch of the Society for uh, organizing all these programs. I'm happy, and again, I thank you for inviting me to chair this session. Uh, and also, it is my honor and privilege and pleasure. So, but in between, I just want to uh, uh, request to you that, as I said, the, our net connection is a bit, uh, I mean, uh, the, I'm in a hilly, a uh, resort of uh, Kodai Canal, attending a Tamil Nadu uh, Psychiatric Society's um, state conference. So in between, I might be going on and off. So do, I mean, forgive me for that. And I wish this program a great success. And I'm happy, once again, thank you for inviting me. And I'm sure uh, we will be much by the wisdom of a, such a sea. Uh, who was the president of uh, WBA earlier. So, once again, uh, welcome you all, sir, on behalf I welcome, uh, and with respect, I welcome Dr. Afzal Javed, 
the current president of WPA and the current today's speaker, Dr. the guest of honor, Dr. Gautam um, Shah and Dr. Uh, another special guest, our friend, Dr. Sashadri. Sash I congratulate everyone you and wish you this program a success. So please do once again, I repeat, my please forgive me in case I, I may not be in a position to be continuously there because of uh, quite uh, uh, quite unreliable network here. Thank you so much. Good luck. Please try to be here for maximum time. Yes. You have to conclude also. Adil sir, thank you. Keep on inspiring us and guiding us. Over to our dada, uh, Dr. Gautam sir, who is our special guest, guest of honor and is the SAC president. Gautam sir. Thank you, Amrit Bhai. It is a really great honor to be present such an excellent program today. 100th episode of Thursday Music. In fact, no words is sufficient for them, this trio, Dr. Tufan Puti, Dr. Amrit, Dr. Alim Siddiq. No words is sufficient. Whenever I still, I remember whenever we have started this, I talked to Amrit that this, we should make this program the India's best webinar program in this time. And it is there. And I'm really thank and grateful to all of you that you have done this, you proved this. It is the one, one of the most, one of the most important and most efficacious, you can say, webinar around whatever webinars we are doing regularly in India. And definitely respected Professor Abjal Javed, the president of the World Psychiatric Association. We have with guest speaker, our own Dr. Dinesh Kumar Bhugra. You know that we are lucky enough to get him as a speaker today. Last time, I think some SARC meeting, we missed him in person, but in next program, I don't want to going to miss him. You know that WPA Regional Congress by SARC will be in April 23. I'm sure I'm confident that Sir will be with us in person in their meeting. We have another senior member of the Indian Psychiatric Society, past psychiatry, my guru, Dr. E. Mahandash. Sir, we are regularly blessed by you. That is also one thing we know how to fight, how to give energy, not only to the organization, also the young members of the society. And I'm confident that this trial, Amrit, Alim, Dr. Tufan Puti, there are lots of things those of with the senior one, but they will definitely contribute whatever they contributed till now. We want to contrib uh, contribution by them is much more whatever they have done. We are eagerly waiting for those days and Indian Psychiatric Society will be definitely as a immediate past president of the Indian Psychiatric Society, I am saying that we are lucky enough to get a junior and senior mixture of all this people in the Indian Psychiatric Society, as a SARC Psychiatric Federation, what I can say, what Professor Abjal Javed said, yes, it is the so beautiful, so beautiful program and scientific program you have organized in the webinar. The link will be same, we'll, if you permit, we'll share in the SARC Psychiatric Federation also. If you, and this, this time, 100th episode, I shared the link with the Bangladesh, Nepal doctors, and in future, I'll share eight countries. I'll definitely share this link to the eight countries under the South countries. It will be a great show. And I'm really lucky enough to get a brothers like both of you, Alim and Amrit, and Dada like Dr. Tupan Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you, Gautam, sir. Your encouragement, your guidance has made us start it and reach where we are. Thank you, Gautam. We know you are with us always. Next, uh, next, uh, next, double century waiting. Don't. Next, we have the yeah. uh, our rock star psychiatrist, Dr. Shekhar, sir. Is the blockbuster, you know, man always there whenever we need him? Be it the 91st episode, be it the 23rd episode, sir has always been there with us, sir. I would request you to set the context of the whole talk of Dinesh, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Amrit. What a momentous uh, occasion, this 100th episode of uh, Thursday Musings to start with. Congratulations to Tofanda, to Amrit and to Aline. Momentous also because we have Afzal Bhai, Salaam Alaikum Afzal Bhai, and uh, our 
friend, uh, Dinesh Bhugra, who is going to address us in this uh, 100th uh, episode of Thursday Musings. Friends, the pandemic has uh, compelled us to work on a reset in everything that we've thought about medicine and medical practice. Uh, if you look at the whole story as it emerged uh, towards the end of the first wave and the beginning of the second wave with fight for hospital beds and uh, oxygen cylinders and the kind of uh, violence that took place against uh, doctors. And if you look at this against the context of Dr. Dinesh Bhugra's address today, which is mental health and well-being of doctors, we are talking not just of psychiatrists, but of doctors. It has been said in the past that mental health morbidity among professionals is highest in doctors and among doctors highest in psychiatrists, including issues like substance abuse and the phenomenon of suicide. The irony is that every sector has a human resource development in HRD section or department. The corporate world has got into team building, uh, into well-being and mental health issues. And somewhere it appears to me that internationally, the medical world has lagged behind in the kind of robust frameworks that we need to really address the mental health and well-being of our own uh, fraternity, right through undergraduate uh, studies to when you get into practice and the kind of dilemmas and challenges that medical practitioners face, which constitute mental health challenges and the kind of stress that they have to deal with in the course of their medical practice and their consultation. Now, this is the framework that we need to keep in mind as we need, uh, listen to Dr. Dinesh Bhugra, who will uh, enlighten us on mental health and well-being uh, of uh, doctors. And uh, I think it is telling that in the 100th episode of Thursday Musings, uh, that we have an obligation to our own fraternity, uh, which we sometimes forget uh, in the kind of social responsibility, understandably so, that our profession has. S ironically, the aircraft industry got this very well. You remember the announcement that they make. Uh, if there is an issue, first put the oxygen mask on yourself before you put it on to your children. Addressing the well, our own well-being uh, as something that is fundamental as a platform, then to be able to offer the kind of assistance that the people that we serve need is, is very critical particularly as we address issues like burnout, uh, professional stress, um, the kind of competitiveness that uh, uh, corporate medicine has brought upon us. So, so there are many issues that pertain to mental health and well-being uh, that form the framework of what will be addressed today. This is the context, friend, of Thursday Musings, the 100th episode, a momentous episode. Congratulations to the team. And over to you, Amrit to get the ball rolling for this very, very important issue that affects and addresses all our lives. Over to you, Amrit. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sikha, sir. Thank you for talking about the whole context of when, on which these, this topic is so, so important now. So may I request Dr. Mohanda sir to please introduce the guest speaker and start with the proceedings. So. I mean, at, at the outset, let me congratulate the trio of our Alim and Amrit and the team for the wonderful work they have done. It's a hundredth um, episode. And COVID has really taught us a lesson to be more academic and many platforms are there. And one of the excellent platform is the Thursday Musings and uh, big congratulations to them. Also happy it, to have WPA president, Dr. Afsal Javed, during COVID epidemic, he has um, outlined many educational programs all throughout the world it is on the websites. 
and um, you could get him and that uh, the, the, the credit goes to you. And uh, Gautam uh, doing very well in the SARC Federation and Yenan Daju, our IPS president and all the executives um, and um, of uh, the, those who are attending is a big thank you. I will uh, mention about my younger brother, Shekhar Sheshadri. Though he looks a little bit old because of his hair, but Shekhar, you are still very, very young. Very, very young. Now, it is my duty to introduce Dinesh Bugra. If any psychiatrist of Indian origin, if he doesn't know Dinesh, I think it is a pity. Dinesh is from India, but he is settled abroad. He has contributed so much to international psychiatry, not only the Royal College, WPA, uh, and also and, uh, most of the academic sessions. Initially, uh, many people, we used to ask the students sometimes, uh, what is um, Julian? Uh, Julian left, who uh, he was famous for. And the has uh, really worked with him, uh, as far as I know. Uh, and uh, the contribution to him in social psychiatry field, his organizational psychiatry field, especially for our Indian organization of um, psychological, uh, basically international organization of psychological medicine. And he was the person who has really named it Indo-Global Psychiatric Initiative. I mean, uh, uh, the tribute, I mean, all these things really go to him. And uh, Dinesh, uh, I think he is not that elder to me, <laughs> but um, uh, he's a friend of mine. And uh, the bio sketch, I think it is uh, futile for me to read it. It will come almost like a book or booklet. I don't want to spend much time. I'm happy that she's here to address the hundreds episode of Thursday Musing because of um, Tufan, Alim, and um, uh, Amrut, uh, their promotion. And big thank you to Dinesh. I could at least see him uh, <laughs> through the web. And uh, we will listen to him. And uh, I don't know how well I am. He's talking about mental health. Giving. Physically, I was not well. Last 10 days, I was down with fever. And now the sound has really come out today. And I, I hope that I can stay for some more time. Otherwise, Alim and uh, Tofan, they have to do it because I'm physically not well. I have severe back pain and uh, a little bit of respiratory problem. However, I'm extremely Mandu, thankful Mandu, to the organizers. The next slide of Dr. Gugra. Yeah. Uh, thankful to the organizers to having uh, to have the nays one of the excellent speakers for your 100th program. Thank you very much. He can share the slides and start, um, uh, I think, teaching us. And he's always a teacher and Only a good friend of mine. Dr. I don't know whether he did or did it. Uh, I, I hope still you are a friend of mine. <laughs> right, thank you. Dr. Mohandas, there is another slide of Dr. Dinesh Vigra. Let the audience see. Mr. Mohandas, is... is I don't think that you do, you distribute through your this thing because if any psychiatrist of Indian origin doesn't know Dinesh, uh, I think um, uh, he doesn't know psychiatry. His contribution to uh, cinema and psychiatry, media, mental health. I mean, if I just talk, I start talking, it will be a lecture by itself. I don't want it. Let I am Dinesh. Up, I am uh, up, and I don't want to talk about what... Um, Shagar told about what is burnout, what is compassion fatigue, uh, what is happening among doctors. I don't want to talk anything. Let him talk whatever he feels like. He is such an expert uh, like that. So I don't want to add anything. Let him, don't take his time. Uh, Dinesh, I think you have to start your program. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. I'm going to try and see if I can share. Um, okay, right. And here we go. Um, good evening, Namaskar, Satriyakal, Salam Alaikum. Uh, it's a great, great honor to join you this evening on the 100th uh, Thursday Musings. It's a great pleasure and I'm particularly grateful to Dr. Patti and uh, his team for organizing it and inviting me. And when we talked about uh, the topic, uh, that as to what I would like to talk about, uh, we decided that burnout among doctors as well as medical students is going to be a good topic for a number of reasons. Some of you may have heard me give this some parts of this talk in IPS in uh, Kolkata about three years ago, I think before, uh, two years ago, before we were hit by the pandemic. So lots of things have changed since then, but what I'm going to do are three things. One, I'm going to sort of talk about what we mean by burnout because it means different things to different people. What I'm going, and then I'm going to give you some data uh, from doctors and medical students in the UK, but also some international data on medical students, particularly those who have, um, it will become clearer because we did uh, studies in 12 countries, including India, and then we expanded it to another 20, uh, 25 countries to look at uh, burnout in medical students. And then I'm going to sort of present some uh, recommendations as to what we ought to be doing. And again, I think one of the interesting things is that um, I came to this notion of uh, burnout and looking after oneself quite late in life. As doctors, we are just trained that, you know, you will look after yourself and you will carry on and everything will be fine. It isn't. Um, and one of the advantages for Indian psychiatry particularly is that um, medical students are taught preventive and social medicine. However, within that preventive and social medicine, there is very little mention of mental health. And I think one of the challenges uh, for IPS and other organizations is to work uh, and change the curriculum in medical schools and in postgraduate training to make sure that mental health and training in mental health becomes incredibly coherent and integral part of training. So what do we mean by burnout? And I think the first, it needs to be differentiated from stress. Um, Burnout is about uh, you know, what happens to us when we are put under pressure, the feelings we get when we, there are demands placed on us that we find difficult to cope with. And that has become very, very, very clear in the pandemic because there's been consistent demands, not only from the policymakers, but also from patients and their families and patients who uh, have survived COVID and then uh, they've lost their families. And as we were hearing earlier, the problems in India of not gaining access to simple things like oxygen, and then um, you know, car parks being turned into crematoria and um, cremations taking place there. And burnout is a pervasive and debilitating state. Uh, which results from an unsustainable period of overwhelming stress. It's not unique to medical professionals, but there are specific issues to do with medical profession that I want to spend some time talking about. Classically, it's an experience of physical, emotional, and mental exhaustion caused by long-term involvement with situations which are emotionally demanding. And we know right from the day you graduate from medical school and you start your internship, there are constant pressures, the constant demands from um, the hospital, from um, the patients, from their families, from their carers. And 
what we need to bear in mind is that there are three key components of burnout. There's emotional exhaustion, there's depersonalization, and an absent sense of personal accomplishment that you feel that I've not accomplished anything. I've spent a whole day, I've spent a whole week, I've spent a month in the hospital, but you know, you constantly are uh, getting criticisms and very little praise. So emotional exhaustion is when you feel emotionally overextended by your work. Um, it affects relationships, it affects life outside work, it affects your work-life balance. And then there's a sense of depersonalization where you feel unempathetic, you very impersonal response to interaction with patients and their carers and unfeeling. And this poor sense of self-accomplishment uh, or its complete absence and more um, has been seen certain uh, subspecialities of medicine. So burnout and stress need to be differentiated. Stress is about over-engagement, it's about overactive emotions, it's about urgency, it's about hyperactivity, which can lead to anxiety disorder. Whereas burnout is about disengagement. It's about blunted emotions, it's about helplessness, it's about hopelessness, and it's about feeling trapped, that you can't get out of that. It affects your motivation, affects your hope, makes you feel detached, and because you're feeling trapped, uh, quite likely to start feeling depressed. So what makes us ill? I mean, this is equally applicable to anybody, but you know, there are um, clinical factors, there are societal factors, there are work or environmental factors, and there are personal factors. But we're going to focus very much on this talk on physician and personal factors. I'm going to speak for about 40, 45 minutes and I'm going to leave 15, 20 minutes uh, for Q&A. And that would be really helpful to help us take the next steps. There are three stages of burnout. The first stage is stress arousal, which is typified by difficulty in concentrating. You get memory lapses, you become very irritable, you become anxious, you have physical symptoms of anxiety like poor sleep, palpitations, panic, uh, loss of libido, etc. And the second stage leads to a period of energy conservation and maladaptive strategies such as avoidance. You don't show up in the clinic, you don't answer your phone call, uh, you don't do the work that is expected of you, you withdraw. If you're in a hospital, you may stay on in the duty room rather than being on the wards where you're expected to be. You're constantly late, consistently late for your shift work and you get excessive sick leave. And third and final stage is exhaustion which is associated with anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, apathy, and then poor decision-making. So what that tends to do is that quite often, as I said, that you, know, you may be delaying doing the procedures, clocking patients, dictating letters, or making decisions. You may arrive early, leave late, but you still haven't achieved very much. Um, you have unexplained absences, um, and in the clinic, you may get into clinic rage, uh, bursts of temper, shouting matches, reacting badly to being criticized, which are real or imagined. You just feel that people are against you and people are trying to get you and you start to uh, shout. You may become very rigid. Um, you may see that if you are feeling burnt out, junior colleagues or nurses may find a way to avoid you. Uh, to seek other doctor's opinion or help. And you may have difficulty with your exams, your thesis, your research, your vivas. Um, you're not sure whether you're in the right speciality, uncertainty about career choice, feeling disillusioned with medicine. And I, you reject constructive criticism, become very defensive and start counter challenging things. And what burnout leads to, and we know that there's considerable amount of literature um, over a very long period that medical errors increase, uh, your sense of professionalism uh, falls, patient satisfaction disappears, and you know there is increased staff over and reduced hours, and obviously depression and suicidal ideation. 
This was a study from uh, Australia where they looked at trainees uh, mental health and what they found was the symptoms of um, depression were highest during the first postgraduate year. So as just when you start your specialization, you start to feel depressed. And there are you know, issues related to uh, family background, perceived overwork, financial problems, difficulties in um, settling down, uh, accommodation, et cetera. And I'll come back to that. And what these authors found was that uh, you know, those in uh, training, um, again, found that they were really stressed out, so work-related, uh, burnt out. And these were related to uh, depression and difficulties in managing workload. Not surprising that that's uh, what tends to happen. And the patient contact was not beneficial to the patients or uh, the doctors. So in the same survey, nearly a quarter had acknowledged feeling suicidal in the previous 12 months. And 10% had, uh, had uh, thoughts of suicide in the previous uh, 12 months, significantly higher in doctors compared with the general population, almost twice uh, that of other professionals. And in a systematic review, they found that uh, physicians' relative suicide risk uh, was between 1.1 and 3.4 times higher for male doctors and 2.5 to 5.7 for female doctors compared with the general population. And we heard about that in the introduction. And again, uh, anesthetists, general practitioners, psychiatrists appeared to be associated with the highest risk. And this is a special medical medicine wide problem. Uh, in a survey in 2008, 7,900 surgeons from members of the American College of Surgeons were approached uh, looking at uh, questionnaires on suicidal ideation, uh, you, you, their use of mental health services, uh, depression, burnout, and quality of life. In a, bearing in mind uh, that only 31.7% had responded, but these were 7,905 surgeons. 6.3% reported suicidal ideation during the previous 12 months, more common in older surgeons, and between 1.5 and three times more common than the general population. And not surprisingly, uh, only a quarter, 26% of the surgeons who had suicidal thoughts had considered seeking help or had sought help, and 60% were reluctant to seek help and there are a number of reasons for that and I'll come back to that because that's absolutely critical in our understanding. I just want to touch upon two kinds of double bind that we have which are to do with stresses of doctoring. On the one hand to be a good doctor one needs to be able to relate to patients, be empathic and be humane. And yet we expect doctors to be professional, to keep your distance, to be detached. You can't have it both ways. And what that does is that double bind that you don't know how you're going to respond and how you're going to deal with uh, creates that sense of abandonment. And that can contribute to this uh, burnout sense because you have lack of control over your workload. Um, you find it difficult to make decisions. Work can be quite monotonous. You know, you're sitting in your clinic and okay, you may be making a fair bit of money and you, but you're seeing patients for only about five minutes and you're consistently um, patient after patient are presenting with the same problems and you kind of switched off and you automatically start um, their treatment without spending as much time as you would like to. And the work can be quite chaotic. And you know, in healthcare, generally, it's mundane, routine work, which is interspersed with very complex, urgent, emotionally demanding tasks. We know that in psychiatry, in surgery, in any speciality. And partly it is to do with the income. About 10 years ago, I did a survey in Haryana uh, members of the Indian Medical Association in my hometown, we approached them and did a survey of burnout. 
and the rates were less than 2%. And the explanation generally was that people were making reasonable amount of money. They could decide who they saw when they saw them. So they had a control over their working life. And that is quite important, particularly in medicine. And I just want to um, come back to that a bit later on. And the other issue that we need to be thinking about is the personality traits. We expect doctors to be perfectionists. We need ourselves to be a bit obsessive. And yet uh, the expectations are that we can't because it's um, there are constant expectations. So you can't, that, uh, that is another double bind between being obsessive and being very controlling and making sure that you do the right thing. And yet the pressure on seeing X amount of patients every day and filling in Y amount of forms and uh, so on and so forth. So it's, as doctors, we are dealing with physical and emotional distress all day, particularly in psychiatry, patients can are distressed, they are disturbed. We get distressed and disturbed, listening to their stories, uh, holding their hands, dealing with their families, constant demands. And then there is this emotional giving that we are giving emotionally all day and night. So who gives to us? Um, quite often there's lack of feedback except for complaints. Very rarely in psychiatry in particular, you would get letters of thanks. Uh, once uh, you've treated somebody, um, you see them in the supermarket or on the streets, they will ignore you completely because they don't want to be reminded that um, they had a psychiatric problem. Quite often in private sector, you're working in isolation with very poor support, long hours, poor family relationships, work-life balance, as I said, can be quite problematic. And then the medical politics, politics of medicine uh, can be incredibly stressful. So partly it is, as I said, that the double bind that we want to be professional, but we have to be empathic as well. And that tension, how do you overcome that? We want to be perfectionist, have very high standards, but can't deliver because of pressures on time, because of pressure on resources and a whole host of other factors. Patient expectations are changing. And certainly my understanding, having talked to very many doctors in India is that uh, doctors are, uh, I don't know whether that's still the case, were under Consumer Act. So that meant that patients were customers not patients, and their expectations then change because I'm paying for it, I want A, B, and C. And uh, quite often there is a lack of working in teams and that support that I was talking about. And we saw that 60% of surgeons uh, hadn't considered seeking help, partly because of stigma, uh, that you know, why would I want to go and see a psychiatrist and self-stigmatization, and a lot of doctors are concerned that it would affect their medical license to practice, so they would lose their livelihoods. So they may end up self-diagnosing, self-medicating, and I'll come back to that. And then there are challenges by the medical council and other regulators as to what they would expect from us. So quite often it would be that, you know, if you are in a a uh, big general hospital, people may stop you in the corridor and seek advice, or a friend of mine is feeling like that, rather than saying, I am feeling like that. Uh, so you kind of make those kind of um, advisory decisions, standing in a corridor um, with lack of privacy, probably lack of confidentiality, which then adds to this barrier to help seeking. So as I said, that we did this um, survey, which was published about 14 years ago, um, and my interpretation is that that was related to people being in private practice and having uh, control over their working hours. So when I had the good fortune of uh, being elected president of the British Medical Association from 2018 to 2019, I suggested that I was going to do three tasks. There were three things that I wanted from the BMA and one, and probably the most important one was uh, getting them to do a survey. 
um, of the mental health and well-being of doctors and medical students. So we started this online survey, which was launched on World Mental Health Day. Uh, we were given three weeks for people to respond. Uh, it was online and, you know, you can sort of think about all kinds of problems with online surveys that people who are stressed, stressed, stretched, distressed, may be the ones who respond. People who may be in serious need may not. On the other hand, being anonymous survey, people may feel comfortable and may feel confident enough that they can write their responses. We used Oldenburg Burnout Inventory, which is free to use, and it assesses the two core dimensions of burnout. As I said, exhaustion and disengagement, not the sense of accomplishment. Uh, we didn't cover that. We just looked at these two because um, it was kind of easy assessment tool to use. And we focused very much on exhaustion. Um, we had 4,300 uh, usable responses. 80% of the doctors reported that they were at high or very high risk of burnout, with junior doctors most at risk. 27% um, in line with the general population data uh, reported being diagnosed with a psychiatric condition at some point in their lives. And like the American surgeons, 7% uh, admitted that they were diagnosed in the past year. 40% of respondents, uh, respondents were currently suffering from a broad range of psychological and emotional conditions. And those who were working more than 51 or more hours per week were most likely to say that they were currently suffering. And 90% of respondents acknowledged that their current working training or studying environment had contributed to their condition, either to a significant extent or a partial extent. And in primary care, half of general practitioners said that they or their practice had sought help or support for a condition which was affecting their work or training. And um, what was really frightening was that one in three admitted that they were using alcohol, drugs, self-medication or self-prescription uh, to cope with a mental health condition. Men and older doctors were more likely to engage in regular use of alcohol, drugs, self-medication, and prescribing to cope with their condition. And we then, uh, after we looked at this data, we decided that we were going to do a qualitative um, piece of work. So we randomly selected uh, 66 doctors and medical students, uh, which were sort of entirely representative of 4,300 uh, respondents. And we did a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews, focus groups, and so on and so forth. So we came up with five uh, types of factors, problems with structures of the, problems with the job, problems with the relationships, and problems with the environment within which you work, and then sociocultural factors. So they were systemic factors, which were the structural factors. Quite often there was understaffing, there were rota gaps, people were staying late, people had very different work-life balance. And there were rather tragic instances where people were exhausted and while uh, driving home in the morning after a very busy night or having been on call for a long time, uh, they were involved in uh, road traffic accidents and tragically there were a few deaths there were blame culture. As I said earlier, that quite often when you something goes wrong, you get blamed, uh, you get a complaint, but very often you don't get any appreciation. And people reported that they had less time available to spend on the main role of patient care. And medical training, because you rotate certainly every four months or six months, so there is no continuity, there's no sense of belonging and certainly in the UK, uh, there's increased paperwork, increased regulatory fears and uh, shorter periods of consultation. And then, uh, you know, if you have traumatic events, quite often there's no debrief, there's no recognition of impact on the individual. And rapidly evolving medical pharmaceutical landscape means that you are constantly 
updating yourself and running to stand still. And fear of judgment, erosion of peer relationships and support in the workplace. And there are intergenerational differences. And we looked at that, that certainly um, millennials and younger generation have very different expectations of work-life balance. They do different things. Uh, they expect different things. Whereas people of my generation quite often, oh, you know, we did one and two due to Rota, so why, you know, why can't you do it? And it's somehow, if the junior doctors complain, then that is seen as a problem. And quite often, uh, in many settings, you're working in isolation. Then, uh, particularly on hospitals, the lack of breaks, lack of basic amenities, and quite often, um, the, you know, you're traveling long distance to work, feeling undervalues and changing patient expectations. And certainly, uh, in the UK, many often, when, many, uh, very often, when you're sitting in the clinic, uh, patients will come with a printout from the net and say, "Well, you know, Doctor Google has said this, and how dare you not um, do that?" And in um, again, um, it's kind of last survey that the General Medical Council did in 2018, a very high response rates. Um, you know, a total of 51,000. Uh, doctors uh, with you know 95.6 percent response rates. Uh, they looked at trainees and trainers, and nearly a quarter of doctors in training and over a fifth of trainers told us that they had they, they were feeling burnt out because of their work. And a third of trainees said that they were often or always exhausted at the thought of another shift, and well over a half of trainees and just under a half of trainers, they felt that they were exhausted at the end of their working day. A fifth of doctors in training and trainers told us that they felt short of sleep when at work. Two in five trainees and two thirds of trainers rated the intensity of the work very heavy or heavy. And nearly half were reporting that they work beyond their uh, duty rotas on a daily or a weekly basis. And uh, there were rota gaps and you couldn't find uh, people to do the jobs. And one fifth of doctors felt that they felt short of sleep during work on a daily or weekly basis. 48% worked beyond their duty rotas and heavy workload by 40%. And almost a third, um, so trainees were more likely to feel exhausted in the morning at the thought of yet another day at work compared to uh, about 20% of trainers. So broadly similar, higher in England, marginally lower in Northern Ireland and Scotland, and again, marginally lower in Wales. Similar figures, again, uh, marginally higher in England compared to Northern Ireland, slightly lower in Scotland. This is among uh, trainers. And we then, as I said, um, that, you know, following on from these findings, I, along with Dr. Andrew Molodinsky from Oxford and his team, we decided to go international and look at medical students' mental health. Again, we used Oldenburg burnout inventory, but this time we, in addition, we used general health questionnaire 12 to measure common mental disorders, but we decided to add gauge to excess alcohol use. And we uh, looked at basic demographic details and confidentiality was showed. And there were, um, we got about 3,766 respondents from 12 countries. Uh, <clears throat> And I'm going to sort of focus pretty well on data from India. We had uh, two private medical colleges and two government medical colleges with a total of 597 respondents. 62% uh, scored positive on GHQ, 88% scored positive on disengagement, and 81% on exhaustion. Um, and again, you know, that's uh, compared to, uh, say, for example, I mean, in Morocco, which is roughly in the same 
uh, low to middle income bracket, only 47% of students, 637, and lower number of disengagement, but higher number amount of exhaustion. And again, uh, between 80, 88 and 93%, it's not that much, but uh, it's a problem. And what was fascinating is that 8% of um, Indian medical students uh, reported uh, scored, scoring positive on cage. So they were drinking alcohol above uh, what would be expected almost to a dependence level. And 15% uh, uh, reported using cannabis. And uh, in Morocco, again, it was 5%. And 28% had used um, cannabis, uh, whereas in you know Jordan, it was 8% alcohol and 3% cannabis. In Italy, 9% uh, alcohol and 21% uh, cannabis. Um, and fascinating that uh, you know, in Portugal, 79% of uh, students were using cannabis to cope. And that may reflect that cannabis is uh, legal and e easily available, but that is something that we need to be thinking about. And when we asked them as to which were the stressors, we looked at four stressors, financial, as uh, pressures to do with study, pressure to do with relationships, pressures to do with housing. And again, you would see that in Hong Kong, 98%, uh, although the number is small compared to India, 98% reported relationships uh, uh, stressful, whereas in Paraguay, it was uh, only 41%. India, 18% reported financial problems, 6% uh, reported study problems, 69% uh, reported relationship problems, and 42% reported housing problems. Now, what that reflects to me is that there are different cultural factors that we need to tease out. And it may be that, you know, some of the people watching this or listening to me may want to take this forward. And as I said, we then uh, in 2021, bang in the middle of the pandemic, uh, we did the survey in 25 countries. And again, I'm just going to focus very much on India. Um, 341 students this time. And again, fascinating thing is that right through from Canada, Denmark, India, Indonesia, Iran, 70% um, of women and uh, medical students are women in Canada, 77% in Denmark, 60% in India, 71% uh, in Indonesia, 72% in Iran. And again, 5% uh, reported positive on CAGE, uh, less than 1% in Indonesia, partly because it's in, uh, you know, access to alcohol may be limited. It's a Muslim country, so there might be other factors. 88% overall uh, reported uh, disengagement and 85% of men reported uh, disengagement and 83% of um, men in India reported uh, exhaustion. Um, and again, if we compare that with uh, Nepal, you know, 50% uh, female students, Sri Lanka 68%, uh, GHQ 50% in uh, Nepal and 62% in Sri Lanka, high, uh, almost uh, three times alcohol use in Nepal, um, low levels of exhaustion. Uh, so again, um, both in Nepal and in Sri Lanka, but high level of disengagement in, uh, in Sri Lanka. So we need to tease that out as to what's going on. So medical students were talking about that they had academic stress, increased workload, competition for scores, so that depends upon which subspeciality you choose, high stake exams, maybe there are too many tests and other expectations. In clinical years, it's about unfamiliar environment. You get to see variable type of patients, variable type of supervision, quite often uh, poor role models and then administrative difficulties. And two things that uh, emerged from chatting with medical students in the UK. One 
uh, they sort of said that they felt that medicine had become too technical and that they had not come into medicine to become technicians. Uh, so that was one problem. And secondly, uh, a lot of simulation that you know you were both in exams and in clinical training quite often actors are used uh, as patients. And medical students were telling me that uh, they find that uh, you know they know that the person sitting in front of them is an actor who's being paid to behave like this, so they can't generate that empathy. So that kind of, again, disjunction between empathy and professionalism uh, becomes much more obvious. And then, you know, we know that there are social stresses. You, you know, move away from home. Uh, you may have scored very highly in your school and college exams, but, you know, once you reach medical school, everybody's at the same level. You're forming new friendships, peer expectations change. You may feel lonely. You may have uh, familial, spiritual, financial pressures. And what that sort of reflects to us also is that we know that 75% of psychiatric disorders in adulthood start below the age of 24. So medical students are vulnerable anyway. So what is it that we ought to be doing to make sure Health Education England reported uh, recommendations. They are responsible for uh, education and training for all health professionals. And they made 33 recommendations and when I am not going to go through that. These are available on the web and you can access them, but I just want to highlight a few things. One is that each hospital uh, needs to have a well-being guardian who can make sure that people have access to occupational health, people have access to counseling, people have access to medication in a confidential, private manner without um, being um, stigmatized. And then there's the well being training and uh, check in of well being and health on a regular basis, and so creating space for hospital staff who are learning uh, in the National Health Service. So what they're saying is the mental health and well-being of NHS staff and those learning should not be compromised by the work they do. So there needs to be very clear um, boundaries. Um, certainly when Britain was part of the EU, there was a European working time directive that was uh, uh, more than, you know, you were not allowed to work more than 40 hours, but inevitably in medicine, you know, if you're in the middle of an assessment or seeing a patient, you can't say that, you know, I've got to go. Um, so the challenge uh, for the well-being guardian for each hospital is to ensure that exposure to critical clinical event uh, is discussed, looked at, um, and managed in a way that the staff who have faced death or suicide or, uh, among their patients can feel safe to talk about it and learn from that. And those uh, check-ins, as I said, uh, ready access to self-referral, proactive, confidential um, occupational health service and uh, death by suicide or a learner will be independently examined and environment which is both safe and supportive. Uh, cultural and spiritual needs are met, uh, making a necessary adjustments for the nine groups protected. So gay, lesbian, uh, disabled individuals, and uh, there are nine protected categories in the Equalities Act, so they need to be followed. Uh, so well-being is given equal weight in organizational um, assessments. And we know that the organizational pressures, you know, constantly, particularly in the UK, and you know, you can use this um, in the, in India in the terms of state government. Uh, there is pressure on the hospitals, which is a pressure on the patients, which is pressure on the management, which is pressure to, uh, pressure on senior people, and then on trainees. So what tends to happen is that the maximum power is here and uh, minimum power is here, but they are under the maximum pressure. So no wonder that people feel 
uh, distress. So what we need is personal uh, organizational and governmental changes. So resilience is about an individual's ability to adapt to and manage stress and adversity. And um, so, you know, there are a whole host of other um, factors that I'm not going to go into, but it's critical that we learn and we train the residents that you have to look after yourself, value and maintain your own mental health, recognize ill health in colleagues and offer support, understanding the difficulties and pressures that people may be under, um, use your primary care physician or confidential services before problems become problems, use support organizations, create boundaries, make space for yourself and allow for colleagues and friends, seek help early, share problems with family, friends, colleagues, admit vulnerability. And it is that you are human just like your patients. So identify and prioritize your activity, healthy, balanced lifestyle, good relationships, peer support system, sense of humor, regular breaks, emotional intelligence, and find a voice through professional bodies like Indian Psychiatric Society. And if Indian Psychiatric Society or Indian Association of Private Psychiatrists does not have those kind of um, services available, then maybe the time has come to set those up. Uh, seek help early, have right career, right mix of interests, use a mixture of things, research, clinical, teaching, management, medical politics, medical writing, entrepreneurial bit, change something in your job portfolio every five years, uh, mindfulness training, yoga, uh, understanding your strengths and weaknesses, and make sure that uh, your lifestyle and sleep are not uh, disturbed. Organizations need to make sure the support services are available and publicized, must be confidential, must be fit for purpose. And particularly for trainees, things like Ballant Groups or Schwartz Rounds, where you meet together in an informal way, you can discuss your patients and discuss your transference, counter-transference, but also uh, serious uh, incidents and what you can learn from that and recognizing and prioritizing issue of well-being among doctors. Uh, what do we need to do about selection of medical students? And I think that's something that we need to be uh, seriously considering. Should we go for mature students? Should we go for um, younger students? Uh, and we need to have that debate. And again, as I said, in training them, simulation techniques, are they good? Are they bad? And we need to eliminate tick box learning and how do we keep up with rapid advances. Organizations need to communicate better about their wellness programs, trustworthy confidential uh, monitoring, prevention of bullying and harassment and coaching and mentorship, uh, moral concerns and open listening. And governments must provide adequate funding to do that. But we as a profession need to provide the resources. We need to advocate for our profession, for medical profession to make sure why we need X, Y, and Z. We need to be very clear about training. And as I was saying earlier about preventive and social medicine training and how do we make sure that mental health is part of that and research and evaluation. So, to conclude, I think it's absolutely vital that we learn how to look after our own mental health and well being, how we look after our own self, getting the work life balance right, making sure that um, we look after, we get the right priorities. And I keep telling medical students and trainees that on your deathbed, you're not going to look back at your life and say, I wish I had worked more have fun in whatever you do, be clear as to um, how you get on with your peers, how do you get your support. If you're feeling unwell, if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling distressed, no need to be ashamed, you're human. This will make you a better doctor. And once again, uh, thank you very much Sofan, for inviting me and for organizing the session. 
And I'm really grateful uh, for people tuning in and um, listening. Happy to take questions, comments, and thoughts um, now. Thank you so much, sir. A wonderful lecture indeed. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, OP sir is uh, there, Dr. Om Prakash Singh. Okay. Sir, can we invite you? Yes. Uh, first of all, let me uh, uh, compliment Dr. Professor Dinesh Bugra for really well researched and also have wisdom in it. So both the things are there, but uh, of course this will comment will be made by chairpersons and there will be questions and answers. So I will not go into that. But mm -hmm. as first of all, I want to make a comment as uh, particularly as a teacher uh, for 22 years I am teaching. So I have quite critical. Normally I do not praise many things. Uh, people find it, but this is something which I praise from my core of my heart. This uh, remarkable uh, musings uh, where the quality has been maintained throughout the 100, uh, 100 sessions. And uh, this has been great, uh, great work. I must compliment uh, Dr. Tupanpati, Dr. Aleem, and uh, Dr. Amrit for being there. For the, being there for 100 weeks is not easy. And having quality program, uh, even if we cannot attend all the programs, even if we want it. So that is a great performance. And this is a, uh, I must also be sectarian on today, uh, though it is an international level program, but this is done by a branch of Eastern Zone. So I'm very proud of IPS Odisha branch and all the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. T.S.S. Rao, sir, you uh, There is some problem in my uh, mobile, what I'm actually, are you able to see me? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, okay. 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 I'm uh, really very happy that uh, I participated and uh, learned a lot of uh, things. But I'm uh, bluntly to put it, some of the one of the other area which gets affected, both at uh, say, if you are trying to talk about burnout issues related to the individual, family, society, and his uh, work environment, the sexual area. This is one of the areas we have spoken quite a bit. In fact, uh, Dr. Bugra was mentioning very frequently about relationship. What we have found is this is one of the major area which uh, affected uh, individuals at various levels and uh, to various degrees. In fact, we published uh, certain editorials and uh, reviewed not only from Indian context, SARC, Asian countries, and so also some of the surveys that were carried out to understand not only from the doctors, even other uh, healthcare professionals, this is one of the common area. Some of the media had uh, emphasized quite a bit about what we basically call uh, all the good things that is happening because pandemic and uh, both the partners are staying at one particular place. But what actually was found was that it had increased a uh, lot more in difficulties. It had affected relationship in many ways. Sexual functioning had got affected in uh, various forms. So this is one of the other area also we actually we should uh, need to look into. I am really grateful for a wonderful opportunity that was provided to learn what actually this burnout and we as uh, doctors, one of the most important thing is actually this compassionate uh, stress, extremely common and uh, how actually to overcome. The concluding remarks from Dr. Bubra were uh, very eye-opening and uh, in fact, the message was uh, there actually for everyone to look into. Thank you very, very much for the, such a wonderful opportunity provided. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. G. Prasad Rao, sir, brief comment, please. Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't say comment, but I would say I am thoroughly enjoyed Dinesh. And uh, Dinesh, thank you for saying that I'm still not a burnout. I mean, I'm maybe in the process of burnout, but no. I think I still you work. See, and you see, you, you are a very good example. Sorry, let me... Um, you, you're a very good example because you use spirituality. Thank you. Thank you. So, <laughs> you know, that, that's, an, you know... That's it. One yeah. major way of um, avoiding burnout. <laughs> burnout. And most important, I think, Tupan. Tupan has led the way along with Alim and uh, Amrut that Indian Psychiatric Society as uh, by two presidents of WPA, first by Dinesh and second by Abzal, 
by their lectures. Mm -hmm. And we are happy that our contribution will be there in the uh, WPA website for everyone to see. Uh, Dinesh, thank you very much. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, including the last part, what you suggested. I think the associations have a large role to see that the burnout doesn't happen so soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Do you want to comment? Me? Mm. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think, I mean, there are, as I said, there are things and, you know, people have different ways of dealing with stress. Some people like to jog, others listen to music. And you know, for me, you know, kind of watching old Bollywood films on YouTube is my relaxation. So, you know, from the 60s and Lata Mangeshkar playing in the background, you know, I can just chill out. Others may need to do meditation or yoga or other things. So one needs to find what's important, what works for an individual. And, you know, one of the questions that has uh, come up is that whether, um, you know, how soon should we start? I think this needs to start from day one of medical school, that we need to train medical students how to look after their mental health and well-being. And if I had the power, I will start teaching psychiatry from day one, not in the fourth year for two weeks, but from day one, because that mind-body dualism creates havoc in people's lives, both in the clinicians, but also patients. So we need to, any pressure that IPS can put on rearranging the curriculum uh, would be very welcome. And part of that challenge for all of us, both as trainers and as supervisors is to make sure, and I say to medical students and trainees, that you know, the reason I'm investing in them is that they can look after me when I'm old and decrepit. So I want good psychiatrists to look after me when I'm kind of, you know, um, doddery, doddery and um, so it, 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 it's selfishness from that point of view. And I think we need to push that agenda. And TSS's comment about libido is, well taken. I did mention it right at the beginning in the symptoms, um, but it's only one of many. And I know that, you know, he's a sex specialist, so he would talk about sex given any occasion. But it is uh, important that we look at the whole thing rather than just one symptom. And I think uh, there was Can another you question, sir. Can you put the questions to you, sir? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, please do. I was just kind of reading that. Um, sir, sir, I, um, I'll continue with what you had spoken, sir. sir okay, please do. Sir, in your report, you have mentioned 63% of Indian students report relationship issues. Sir, what is the solution to these problems? I think one of the things that we picked up qualitatively in talking to some of the Indian medical students, I mean, these relationships were also to do with parents, that quite often parents are medics and they've sent their children to medical school, and then they want them to choose the speciality that the parents were doing so that they can hand over the hospital and the clinical and the services. So that tension um, has been subsumed under the relationship heading that you know, parents are supporting them financially and yet there's a tension. I really don't want to be a psychiatrist or I want to be a psychiatrist, but uh, you know, my parents want me to be a surgeon. So that plus the fact that uh, you know, lots of people have left home for the first time and um, forming relationships and friendships and you know, getting that level can be quite stressful. And it, it, it's universal. I mean, as you saw from the tables, it's, you know, in every country, uh, in some it's a bit more, in some it's a bit less, but it's the same. Yeah. So there is a universal question in the chat box. How to deal with injustice and discrimination at workplace due to political factors or some other things? So, so how to deal with it? 
there are several ways that one can do. I mean, one is that I understand uh, the Indian healthcare system and I understand the training system very well. Um, and yes, it may be difficult uh, in certain circumstances to to stand up and you know um, kind of um, criticize um, you know people who are employing you. But that's where organizations like IPS and you know your um, power comes into play because if you work with the equivalent of Medical Council of India, I don't know what it's called now, but if you were to sort of set standards that um, you know there would be a mental health and well-being charter which every hospital who gets a resident or a trainee has to sign up to, otherwise the you know medical council equivalent will uh, take their training post away. And that's where the outcomes will come in. And that's where all of us have a moral responsibility to be advocates, not only for our patients, but also for our trainees and other healthcare staff. Dr. Radhakrishnan has raised hand. Please ask him to unmute. Dr. Radhakrishnan, please. Sir, <coughs> Namaskar. It's a very Namaskar. beautiful session. Very beautiful presentation. First of all, I congratulate the team, Dr. Thorpen Pari and his team, to bring uh, Dr. Dinesh Bhugra to our session. My question to uh, Dr. Dinesh Bhugra, <coughs> sir, what is your opinion about the factor that the cultural and family support in, in, in India for doctors are very high? Even now, if you avoid some uh, individual incidents, the, still the society is respecting doctor and uh, a, a demigod phenomena is still existing in most part of the country. So the burned out uh, problem is much less in the, if you take India as a whole. How you compare this with the UK situation? It's I think, about, we, we, sorry. The, the cultural factors and family support system in India is much higher than other countries. Yeah. And, I, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, there are sort of specific issues. And if you would see, if you remember from the slides that are showed that UK has very different um, yeah. healthcare system. It has very diff, uh, different um, rates. And partly it is to do with uh, that quite often, um, you know, it, it's a very egocentric society and you know, very much focused on the individual rather than the community. Having said that, I think there are different challenges in India because, because it's a socio-centric uh, collectivist society, the expectations are very different and a lot more because you know, you expect, you're expected to look after your kinship, your extended family, your joint family, your tribe, and so on and so forth. So part of the recommendation that I was making that you know, IPS and other organizations set those standards is to do with what's applicable to, you, to the local culture, not, you know, you can certainly, certainly we need to learn from each other so that we don't make the same mistakes. Simulation is a good example. And I don't know how much simulation goes on in uh, India, but a lot of it goes on in Guatemala and I've seen it uh, in practice in you know, many parts of Central America. And there are different challenges. So my advice would be to look at the cultural context and then develop strategies to make sure that the next generation is safe, uh, that they don't go through the process of burnout and they don't go through um, the sense. I mean, one, one of the big challenges in the UK is that the dropout rate among uh, young doctors as soon as they finish their internship is huge. It's massive. And we still haven't come to grips with why is that? And some of them completely give up medicine, having done medicine for seven years. Others migrate to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, America, and elsewhere. So again, there are those kinds of challenges for Indian medical schools. How, what proportion of your medical students you'd 
losing and what does that mean and once you migrate the pressures are different cultural context is very different and stresses are very different so what you need to do is look at um, what works locally not what works in the uk i'm just giving you some examples to think about that you know would it work that way would apollo or max or any other chain have a well-being guardian probably not but having a telephone service provided by Indian Psychiatric Society, even if it is three hours a day, anybody who's stressed, any doctor who's stressed can ring that service confidentially and say, I feel stressed. And you can then point them in the direction of you know, local offices in Tamil Nadu and Haryana and Bengal, whatever. So, you need to think about those kind of challenges. Thank you, sir. Can I come in? I want to say two or three things. Hello. Uh, yes. It was a very good lecture, Dinesh. Uh, Thank uh, you. You, re you remember uh, we had breakfast meeting in uh, a hotel in when you came, where I talked about this very passionately. You know, that you we should uh, be talking about self-care as the thing. Uh, secondly, I agree with you about the spirituality because just about a month back in MPA talk, I gave a talk on spirituality and mental health, underused resource in India. I'll be happy to share it with uh, anyone uh, about that. But the more important thing which I want to share with you is the resistance by the professionals to teach self-care. Yeah. I mean, uh, on this 100th occasion, I just don't want to give a negative one, but we put this in the position statement of uh, the IPS uh, during the pandemic. That's the only area where we have not done anything at all. Even in these 100 sessions, there is hardly one or two, one by me about a year back, where we have talked about self-care as being important. The point which I'm making is not about myself, that we need to really develop things which people can use to maintain their health. Let me just give you one example which I'm doing in the last two years. No, recognizing caregivers of mentally retarded children are very stressed. We have developed a one-day self-care module. Five things they can do to take care of themselves, five things they can do when they feel distressed, and it has been very well received. I think each of the sessions, each of the centers should become a mental health center rather than a psychiatric center. I don't know whether uh, Prasad Rao will remember after this 2015 conference, I said, why don't you make a poster where people can maintain mental health? Unfortunately, we seem to be resisting. And I, I'm not saying it as a criticism, I said no area where we should talk about mental health to every patient. The same way we, I say that every caregiver should be asked about his or her mental health. And if we can do enough research, like we have done with yoga, about exercise, sleep, nutrition, excellent book by Sanjay Gupta, Keep Sharp, which brings together the, all the evidence, I think make it possible for people to uh, avoid a burnout. Thank you very much. Sir, can I, can I, can I just get in, sir? Just a minute, sir. Sir, last, uh, in the second wave, our IPS had made a helpline, sir, where actually we had a collaboration with the World Health Organization and NIMANS, and there was a, supposed to be a platform for healthcare workers. So we had this 800 psychiatrists and mental health professionals. We had volunteered 10,000 man hours every week. You know, it's a, it was for a period of four to five months. The WHO project did not take off, but we had advertised the whole, the, the whole all the numbers of, you know, the volunteers across all the states. And we had volunteered 10,000 hours. It, it went on for six months and we managed to take care of a lot of people during the COVID time. So IPS has not taken a backstage. They were giving more than 14 to 14, 16 hours per day, per period of four to five months, where, where people could connect to us and talk to us. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Out. I want to add also with Amrit that last year also we are collaborating with GAPIO, Global Overseas Doctors of Indian Origin, for the mental health care of not only the physicians, also all health, mental health carers. It is a worldwide initiative we have done from Indian Psychiatric Society also, sir. And my next question to Dr. Bhogra, sir. Sir, what for coming out of burnout of a doctor, 
I think altruistic attitude is the one of the most important thing. Doing some social service or involved in different works during this period is definitely is a, one of the great way you can overcome your own burnout symptoms. What is your take, sir? I think, as, as I said, I mean, there are um, positives that, you know, burnout makes you feel how the patient is feeling. So you can generate more empathy. But the point that I was making earlier is that the key uh, for everybody is to change something in your job every seven years, five years, seven years. You do something different so that you feel stimulated rather than, oh God, another day and I've got sort of, you know, 100 patients to see. Um, you know, okay, this is my day. I'm going to go to the temple and see patients there uh, in a different environment, in a different way, you know, working with the faith healers, working with the religious leaders, working with community leaders, educating the community, creating something. Uh, so it, it has to be a patchwork of things that people do in order to avoid burnout and in order to uh, keep yourself stimulated. And whether it is altruism, whether it is, you know, going into medical politics, whether it is research, whether it is teaching, whether it's teaching community, teaching medical students. So there are a whole host of things that every few years, um, I mean, in my clinical work, partly because it's the NHS and it may not apply to the Indian context, I started off with a community uh, mental health team, then did community rehab, then did intensive care unit, then did psychosexual clinic, you know. So every few years I was changing something in my clinical portfolio. And that may be something that people can, you know, do in addition to altruism, in ad addition to putting something back into the community. Uh, so you said, ki, uh, if possible, you'd like to introduce teach psychiatry from the first day onwards. So what would you like to teach? I think, again, I mean, one of the big things is this separation between mind and body, that somehow mental illnesses don't affect physical health or physical illnesses don't affect mental health. I mean, you know it, I know it. And we know from, you know, the Ayurvedic models that it, it's kind of integrated, it's holistic, and in addition, things like diet and environment and so on and so forth uh, affect your mental health and well-being. And we now know there's evidence coming through that you know gut biomes affect and can cause bipolar disorders and so on and so forth. So it is it isn't as simple as that you know this is mind and this is body and they don't talk to each other. So partly, I would start by integrating those two from day one that don't see the patient as an organ, don't see the patient as an illness, see the patient as to what's going on, what their kind of social function is, what their um, expectations are. Most patients, given the choice, can live with their symptoms as, so, as long as they have a job, they've got some money in their pocket, they have a roof over their head, they've got some relationships, the kind of things all of us want. So what I would like to get the medical students to start focusing on the person, not the disease, and including what affects that personhood, their sense of the self, their sense of social functioning. Does it make sense or am I talking nonsense? No, I think, sir, that makes good sense. Amrit? Dr. Shashira, madam, has raised her hands. Uh, can, we, can we? She wants to ask something. Sh madam? Then please unmute. And we are not able to hear you. Alim, there are a lot of questions, but I think 
<laughs> and we hand it over to the chairpersons and maybe if possible we call Dinesh sir again. I think we have to wind up, man. Yes, sir. We are winding up. <laughs> we are handing it over to the chairpersons, sir. I mean, thank you very much, Dinesh, for an excellent deliberation as usual. So simple. But people will um, might think how the burnout concept has come. It is basically from uh, Herbert Sudenberger. He has already told of the high cost of high achievement. Then gave the Green's book that is the case of a burnout case. Then you have got um, Krishna Maslas, the inventory, uh, the tripartite model, out of which uh, Dinesh talked about the so-called uh, classification. Um, anyway, it's a little bit different, but anyway, uh, whatever may be thing, I will not go into details because of time constraints. Uh, he has talked about the uh, stress is not equivalent to burnout. Stress may be a stimulus, but burnout is a behavior. It is almost like uh, that enough is enough, nothing more. That is the concept. Basically, in among doctors, it is the demand control imbalance. It is the effort reward imbalance, then inadequate support. And uh, as Dinesh has outlined, multiple factors, whether it's cultural, social, political, or whatnot, everything comes. But most important, you have to remember three R's. You recognize it, try to reverse it, and uh, try uh, to be resilient in whichever way it is possible. It may be spirituality, it may be yoga, it may be a vacation or a solitude, or just, I enjoy reading only <laughs> medical literature or history of medicine. I enjoy like that uh, to reduce my stress out. How, whatever we say, he has already suggested it would be worthwhile to have a well-being mentorship, mentor in your team. It's a good idea how far it is possible, especially in um, everybody talks about Indian culture, Indian scenario. It is entirely different. Many states are there. Each state health policy is a state. Uh, basically, health is a state policy. A different patterns are there. It is different in private, public, the workload that we are doing it. And somebody talked about politics. It is not politics. It is politics. Politics. And how to circumvent it, very difficult. And because he may have to work in a better way through societies, which the Dinesh has already told, we can come out with some of the proposals through the societies, not only Indian Psychiatric Society, uh, Central, but even the state branch, they can adapt to their own uh, cultural tunes and uh, work out some agenda and uh, see among our own doctors, as he has highlighted, and even the world record, world literature also say, more than 50 percentage of the graduates are having run out. <clears throat> but the statistics differs depending upon which year you are taking, the type of atmosphere, the type of uh, people who are dealing with, and uh, many places we know it, mushrooming of medical colleges, there are so many non-teaching professors and they don't know what is to be taught, what is to be learned. I mean, it is a vicious cycle. It's not easy to get uh, escape from that, but theory is very good. Uh, but always we feel good if we can work better, at least through society, in the psychiatric society, or uh, the SAR, uh, Gaudam Saha is there or WPA or whatnot. We do have many, many, many guidelines as he has already told uh, the recent literature. I also used to talk on um, burnout uh, in many of the organizational psychological seminars in different uh, uh, styles. I usually use the dirty dozen, etc. Many, many quotable quotes are there. But you have to think that burnout is an opportunity to reinvent 
then you can do something. I think that is the lesson that we have to take from Dinesh's excellent exposition and erudition. Thank you very much, Dinesh. And nice to have you here and at least to see you and to converse with you through web. And lastly, congratulations to the trio, the leader of art and the workforces, not workforces, workforces in Alim Siddiqui and Amal and others team. And uh, let us just um, enjoy the centenary hundreds effort. I think Shagar is still there and Shadi I am seeing somewhere. OP is there and um, Radhaishan is there. Shashira is there. Arjuna Singh is there. And it's a good attendance. And I hope Thursday missing will still go ahead in the way that they were doing it. And I appreciate it. That is the way you have to go, take up responsibilities and lead Indian psychiatric society. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Dr. Sari. Very fast people. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Sasi, madam. Yeah. Vihang sir is also there. Saji, yeah. sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. So, first of all, let me congratulate the trio. And uh, thank you, sir, Dr. Dinesh Bugra, for such an excellent uh, presentation. Sir, my question is that I feel because women are more forthcoming and uh, more interactive and they come out with their problems faster. So, I feel they should have, be having less of burnout syndrome. What's your take on that? I, I don't think it's a sort of um, as straightforward as you make it out to be because women have much more discrimination against them. They have much more difficulties in getting promoted, uh, more pressures from family, tension between work-life balance. Uh, so as you know, particularly now that you know, 60% of medical students globally are uh, women, I think we have to rethink the way we train, the way we plan workforce, and the way we um, support them. And it, it just because somebody, I mean, it is good that people can share their feeling, but that does not mean that it's always uh, done in a positive way or they might get a positive response. It may be that being a woman can be problematic and there would be misogyny and then there would be pressures. And if then, a woman expresses vulnerability, um, there is every chance that, you know, there will be increased pressure on them to try and, oh, you can't cope with this. Um, I think it, it's kind of, again, there are cultural factors within that context that we need to be thinking about. I think, thank you very much, Dinesh. I think back to the organizers, you have to wind up more than two hours, a, a program. I don't know how we can really so half an hour hey, is the it, 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 it's it's the hundredth one. So you can go on for hundred hours. Yeah, they did. Uh, I thank think you, you thank you have sir. become so resilient. Anyway, we have to wind up. Wind up. Two more yeah. minutes. Sir. Two minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sajid says that. Sajid says that. Sajid says that. Quick comments, please. Uh, so my only point is, how do we standardize this at a micro management level? Whereas doing with individual person complaining of stress and burnout. What exactly can be told to them? This is a huge question because there is a lot of individual variation and we need to have a standard <coughs> pattern. Broadly, we must support them, but support them manje kai. What do you mean by support them? That becomes a big issue at a micro, at an individual level management. Dr. Dinesh, it was wonderful listening to you and it's long time since we haven't met. It's good to catch up virtual. Thank you. Th thanks, Mehang. I mean, I think the challenge the point that you're making is that one size doesn't fit all i think what we need is we need the framework we need the structures so that people can access those things according to their need what works for me isn't going to work for you uh, we know that um, and the way i uh, experience it i express it is going to be very very different so the challenge really is that if we have structures in place, and you know, I did not know that uh, IPS did um, provide that phone service for you know X number of years. If that can be made something regular, and you know, people volunteer, and we were hearing about altruism earlier. Uh, so you know, 
all the distinguished group of psychiatrists spend two hours a week at the other end of the phone, um, that would help, at least it's a start. And then, you know, you can share those experiences and create educational leaflets, guides, standards, charters, not everything is going to be done in one go. So, you know, baby steps. Not only that, sir, last year we have started suicidal helpline also, suicide prevention helpline, also from Indian Psychiatric Society. And it was appreciated by medias and all other organizations very much. Amrit is there, you know, the, sir. We all... Sorry. Sorry. It was also done. And as saying, from the central body as well as from the state level also, individual telepsychiatry was done from each state also in the COVID period. So uh, the members of Indian Psychiatrists as they had done a wonderful role in during this period, as you say it, sir. Sure, sir. Thank you. Shaji, sir, quick comments, please. Uh, I think the point was well made. I think it is not that we have more medical, more women are, uh, are taking up medicine. It's also true that in India, we are seeing more postgraduate trainees are women. And it is likely that there will be more teachers, faculty members are going to be women. And this calls for special changes in the training and work situation so that all their health, physical and mental, uh, can be taken care of. The second point is that there is this presumption that doctors know how to look after themselves. And second presumption is that they need not be taught humanities. We try to teach humanities for tech people. For example, Indian Institute of Science has a, a section devoted to teaching humanities for future tech people, but we don't have one in our, I think health humanities should be given importance. I would uh, want uh, Dinesh to comment on this. Dinesh, it was very useful and very pleasant to hear your talk. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Shadi. I mean, it, the, going back to the point about how do we train the next generation, I think uh, some medical schools in the UK, what they do is when you start, the first month is uh, medicine and society. So they're taught all kinds of other things rather than going straight into anatomy dissection hall and, you know. And I kind of quite jokingly, quite often ask how many people watching this I remember Krebs cycle? Mm -hmm. You know. It's in anatomy, sir. But, the, the point is that, you know, we are still training medical students as, as if this was 1950s. You know, things have changed, things have moved on, and particularly post-COVID with online learning and online teaching, how do we train people to create supportive networks? You know, the whole idea of conferences used to be you met friends like we hung and you kind of, you know, sat in one corner, had a cup of coffee, chatted, caught up with each other's family and so on and so forth. It's not possible in this forum. So what do we need to do differently? How do we engage? How do we train people to look after your mental well-being when you can just see images and not people? And you know, I have no idea who else is listening. Uh, so, you know, in, in some ways, I have to sort of control what I say. Yeah, uh, uh, Dinesh, uh, you have already put it across. Shaji, in many of the schools, there the initial training on um, humanities is there. Uh, some people call it human yora. Especially, I had the chance to go to Indonesia, Sudabayo, and um, at least 90 students were female postgraduates, 90, 90. And the topic that I was talking was human era. And I was not knowing what is the meaning of human era. But the later, the, later only, after when I searched it, it is nothing but humanity. As um, 
Dinesh has already spoken in his talk. What is more important is the dealing with the clients. We have to have the basic um, knowledge, how to empathize, empathy, in the care, the compassion, the way that he talk. I think we have to reinvent the wheel. I think the most important from the first year onwards, that should be the basic lesson and the motivation. And he has told that, the, especially in the wellness mentorship. I mean, he has already told all this thing in the poem. It's very difficult uh, to discuss in one hour session or 45 minute session. And he has covered everything. I think, uh, uh, can we call it a day for Fanji and Alim, Amar, super presentation that we had today, good deliberation, good feedbacks from all the experts. Fun. Sir, we, we'll have a formal thank you from the IPS Odisha State Bank, sir. Is the uh, yeah. Before that, I shall make some observations. I feel that this centenary edition has been a fortunate one. All, all of the faculties, Dr. Dinesh Fugra, who is our esteemed guest speaker, our chairpersons, Dr. Mohan Das and Dr. Inindas, our guest of honor, Dr. Gautam Shah, <laughs> special guest, Dr. Shekhar Sashadri. Anyone whom I have asked, they have immediately agreed. I feel obliged, I feel that we are fortunate. And when I talk, we discussed about the topic and uh, Dr. Bhugra told about this topic, I felt impressed because in a country like India, where the doctor-patient ratio is very low and the situation is more coarse and that to hear most of the practice is being done without the protection of a state or institute. So the stress is much more and for India, it is very important extremely important and this is not only for psychiatry the burnout is for the whole medical fraternity and now nowadays you are giving stress and developing competence of this would be coming indian medical graduates the foremost competence from day one as dr bugra told should be how to take care of oneself and develop resilience and i echo the comment of dr bahia that we have, we have to, we have to have a structured, perform a way for that. Then only we can look for the future safety of the generations that are coming ahead. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Pura. You can, Dr. Ashru and Dr. Devanta, for the final from the IPS Odisha State Bench. Dr. Ashru. Uh, good evening, sir. Namaskar, all the delegates and my seniors. Uh, it is in a indeed proud moment for all us that you have completed uh, the 100 session. In spite of COVID pandemic situation, Thursday Museum has managed to maintain the audience of minimum of, of 300 or above. And it has become an academic brand for the Indian Psychiatry Society. Above this success, I want to congratulate our Dr. Tufan Patisar, Dr. Alim Sar, and our multi-talented, versatile person, Dr. Amrit Parjoshi or Amrit Bhai. The tireless work of all the threes and many more who are behind the screen make it possible. I also thank to the, all the esteemed speak, speakers and the chairperson for all the part of India and abroad who have shared their knowledge which lead us to reach this milestone. Above all, I thanks to the participant without whom it could not be possible to reach this three-digit number and technical support, uh, technical support staff, which should be given the credit. Thank you, sir. Namaskar. And our thanks to the, our academic partner, Karen Pharmaceuticals, in this venture. Thanks, everybody. I am overwhelmed by the comments we have received. I am very much thankful to Dr. Bhugra. Thanks, thanks a lot, sir. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Thank Dass. you. Good night. Good night, sir. Thank you so Good much, night, sir. And thank you and for thank you. Thank you, Gautam.
दादा थैंक यू वन वन सेंचुरी सजेशन इफ इट इज पॉसिबल बिकॉज़ द यू नो दैट द स्पोंसर्स आर देयर दे आर वेब नियर दे आर स्पोंसरिंग इफ इट इज पॉसिबल दोस हु आर हु जॉइन टुडे इफ इट इज पॉसिबल अ गुड कार्ड एंड वन स्मॉल पीस ऑफ केक एज अ मेमोरी ऑफ द 100th एपिसोड स्मॉल पीस ऑफ केक सेंड टू ऑल द मेंबर्स इन पर्सन दैट विल बी रियली गुड everybody. Thank you so much, sir. It was a wonderful event, a wonderful time together. Uh, with your permission, sir, we can close the meeting now. It's a historical yes. day, no doubt of it. Second century is waiting. You will be there also. Definitely. Uh, Shreya, you can close the meeting now. <laughs>